All right, we, we are now going to start with, um, can we have a coin slip? Who has a coin? Well, I thought Prakash was going to go first. You're going to go first? Oh, yes. you're being gracious. That's Thank you, Mark. Okay. Mark is being generous. Okay. Prakash, how many minutes were you told? Um, I was told an hour and then I leave. <laughs> <laughs> the presentation is uh, 20 20 to 25. 20 minutes. Yeah. I, I'll keep it to 15, actually. Okay, good. Okay? I'd I'll like to hear with, from people I'll about it. 20. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Prakash. Okay. Thank you. He's an advisor in the research department of the IMF, and he co-chairs the Jobs and Growth Working Group at the IMF. Okay, well he's done. a good sport. Thanks very much to uh, CPR and to Mark for, for inviting me. Um, I think I... All the organizers, I apologize that I have to leave around 5.15 so that I can go and tweet uh, to a panel that my boss is talking at. Uh, so uh, to keep my job, I have to <laughs> uh, go do that. But I'm sure we'll have, a, I hope we have a, a good debate uh, uh, in, the, in the hour or more that we have. Um, this controls now. Anybody know how to do this? Knows how to this is always the hardest question. Mm -hmm. Do you need to go up here and do Maybe it? Maybe I'll just stand on that. Okay. Okay, so my uh, talk's going to be in, in, in three parts. Um, first, just reminding you of uh, the unemployment situation, I'm sure many of you know about it. Uh, then giving you um, sort of <coughs> my diagnosis and uh, to some extent the IMF's diagnosis of whether the problem in, in Europe, uh, the unemployment problem is cyclical or structural, and finally uh, talk you through what the IMF uh, advice has been on, on European unemployment. So. Uh, in case I uh, mumble or am unclear, uh, I've, I've given you what I would like you to take away from uh, this part of the talk at least. Uh, the outcomes are dire, uh, the outlook remains dire. So these are the unemployment rates in, in the European countries. Uh, this is kind of the latest uh, annual observation that we have. And you can see it's, it's, it's not pretty. Uh, you have uh, unemployment rates in uh, in Greece and Spain, uh, in the range of 20, 25 uh, percent. Portugal, 15 percent. Uh, Bulgaria, over 10. Uh, the bigger states, Italy, France, all all with high unemployment rates. Even Sweden, uh, you know, has an employment rate uh, in you know in the sort of seven, eight percent range. So it's 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 not really a, a very healthy situation <coughs> in almost any part of Europe. Uh, at, at the moment, other than in a few states towards the end, as you can see. You can also look at the wall if you can't see up here. And then, uh, if you look at the change in the unemployment rate since essentially the start of the crisis, I mean, you can see the dramatic increases in unemployment rate everywhere. So Spain has had an increase in the unemployment rate in, over the five-year period uh, of 15%. So I mean, these are very sort of uh, dramatic increases, uh, and I think the ITUC just uh, released a, a report, or is releasing a report today called Frontlines, which I encourage you to read, which you know tells you the human stories behind behind uh, this kind of increase in unemployment. These are not just statistics, I mean, these are just people's lives being just totally uh, sort of ripped apart through, through, through this job loss. And uh, in an earlier uh, paper that I had done uh, with the ILO, uh, we, we documented kind of the human costs of, uh, of unemployment uh, with what we know from, from studies that were done prior to the Great Recession. So, you know, it's no uh, surprise that when people lose their jobs, they lose earnings immediately. Uh, that, you know, that's, that, that's obvious. Uh, but what's surprising is that when uh, people are tracked, uh, so two people who were fairly similar in all their characteristics, except that one happened to lose his or her job and the other didn't, when those people's earnings profiles are tracked, 
even 15, 20 years down the line, uh, the earnings profile of the person who lost their job is, is lower than, than, than of the person, sort of identical, almost identical person who, who didn't lose their job. So, you know, these are, these are just uh, very sh shocking costs that, uh, that, that researchers have documented. And then people have documented impacts on life expectancy. So kind of job loss is, is sort of like losing a, between a year and a year and a half of your life. Uh, in, in life expectancy sense. Uh, people have documented impacts on, on families so that uh, people have shown that if uh, a parent loses their job, a kid is more likely to repeat a grade in school. Uh, the kids feel the cost. Okay. So these are uh, just uh, a very dire situation in terms of human costs. Okay. Um, now, what is the forecast uh, the forecast, as I'm going to show you, is, is also pretty dire. Um, but, I mean, you know, we're not, frankly, very good at, at forecasting these, these developments. So, I mean, let's, let's hope that we are wrong and things turn, for, things turn better. And to show you, um, you know, how, how poorly our, how poor our ability to forecast is, uh, this is what the OECD in December 2007 <coughs> said. Uh, Europe's growth is, is going to be, it said it's going to be about 2%. Um, and for 2009, they said about the same. Uh, the IMF sort of said the same thing in its World Economic Outlook, released in October 2007, uh, and same thing for 2009. So these were forecasts made uh, you know, just before the onset of the crisis uh, about what was going to happen in 2008, 2009. And what was the reality? The reality was growth was essentially uh, close to zero in, in 2008, and this is what happened in 2009. So um, let's hope our ability to forecast remains just as bad in 2013, even though it's forecast to be a very bad year for unemployment, turns out to surprise on the upside. Uh, this is the unemployment rate forecast. Uh, Again, no difference really between us and the OECD, and frankly, even between private sector forecasters. So I could I could have put the consensus forecast, which is a measure of private sector forecasts, and the private sector was doing uh, just as poorly as, as uh, people in the public sector were in forecasting these things. So you can see that uh, you know our unemployment forecasts were sort of way off uh, in 2007. So with, with that caveat and with the hope that we turn out to be wrong, this is what the IMF is forecasting right now for unemployment for uh, 2013 uh, <coughs> for these countries. Basically, uh, very little improvement this year. Uh, I didn't bother to show you next year's because it looks just as bad and our ability to forecast next year is worse than our ability to forecast the current years. So. So that's that's kind of the the just to put us all on the same page in terms of developments. Okay, and then um, let me turn to the second part of the presentation, which is is this uh, unemployment sort of a cyclical issue? Meaning, did unemployment just go up because the economy went into a tailspin, or uh, does the unemployment reflect something beyond that in terms of structural problems? Sometimes people talk about skill mismatches, saying that. There are jobs, but the workers who have been laid off don't have the skills to find those jobs, uh, to, 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 to uh, fill those jobs. Sometimes people talk about uh, mismatches across industries, that you know, the industries that are booming uh, are, are different from the ones where people have been laid off, and it takes, while, it takes a while for people to uh, gravitate towards the jobs in industries that are, are booming. So, so there are all kinds of structural reasons people ascribe. Sometimes people say that if during a crisis you extend unemployment insurance, then people don't have an incentive to search. And so part of the reason for the increase in unemployment comes from the generosity of unemployment insurance. So broadly, there is a cyclical view of unemployment which says unemployment goes up and the economy goes into a tailspin. And there are explanations that stress more the structural side. Now. Uh, let me, at this point, say a caveat with which I should begin all my talks, which is this is my views and not, not the IMF's. Uh, so, I mean, both based on, on, on my own research, and I think this, this is shared within the IMF largely, uh, our view is that the problem in Europe, the unemployment problem, is largely cyclical, meaning that it is, it, it is uh, due to the downturn in the economy that, that happened. And I think, to me, that makes very 
logical sense when you look at the change in unemployment picture that I showed you. Uh, you know, it's difficult to think that that something in the structure of the economy of, of Europe, uh, no matter whatever structural problems you might think existed, you know, suddenly manifested itself in 2007 or 2008 and led to, you know, this massive increase in unemployment uh, everywhere. So, I mean, whatever you might think about the role of labor market institutions uh, or other structural uh, problems, it's difficult to think that something changed overnight in these economies to, to generate this kind of unemployment. So I think the view in the IMF is, and I think we've stated this uh, in the World Economic Outlook as well as in management speeches, that, uh, that it's, it's largely cyclical. But I mean, this is a debate that, that, ha that goes on every time you see a, a huge increase in unemployment. Uh, there are people uh, with the views represented on, on the left of this chart, uh, which are that unemployment is not a structural issue, that it's a problem of inadequate demand and uh, so it's not as though you need to fix labor market institutions each time you have a, a big increase in unemployment. That's not where the problem is. And I think that's largely the view we take at the IMF, that it's a problem of inadequate demand. But as I said, there are views which are expressed on, on the right of the screens here, uh, which stress other factors such as, you know, the ability of welfare states to cope with uh, turbulence in the economy when you need to reallocate uh, labor. Uh, is it the case that having certain labor market institutions comes in the way of, of reallocation, whereas other institutions are more reallocation friendly? So this is, this is an old debate. Each time you have a persistent increase in unemployment about whether it is cyclical or structural. So as I said, the sort of certainly my view, and I think largely shared at the IMF, <coughs> is that uh, certainly the initial increase in unemployment was cyclical. As I said, nothing could have changed overnight in the economy that would have led to such a massive uh, increase in unemployment everywhere. Okay. Now, I mean, over time, um, sure, that you know, there are studies that show one thing or the other, and there's probably greater uncertainty about the relative proportions of cyclical and structural, but I think it, our view is it remains largely structural. Uh, largely cyclical, sorry. And we base this on, on several pieces of, of, of evidence. Uh, one concept that economists use is something called the beverage curve, which is the relationship between the people who are unemployed in the economy and the number of vacancies, you know, the number of sort of help wanted advertising that you see or, or, or job vacancies. And the idea is that if you have both unemployed people as well as uh, vacancies, it's indicating some kind of mismatch because employers are posting vacancies and looking for people and they're unemployed and yet these two uh, set groups of people are, are not coming together. So economists use the, the, the relationship between unemployment and vacancies as a way of kind of sorting out whether unemployment is cyclical or structural. And when you look at the evidence, you see that this beverage curve was sort of stable. Uh, it hasn't shifted out to the right, which is what you would expect if there were huge structural problems in the, in the European economies. Okay. And in fact, even if it shifted out a bit, there is work by Peter Diamond, the, the Nobel laureate, that says you know, these are normal things that can happen over the course of, uh, of a recession. So even inadequate demand can lead to what appears to be a shift of the beverage curve. It's just a loop around, uh, around the original curve. So, uh, the bottom line is when we look at the evidence on the uh, beverage curve, which is one of the, as I said, the key indicators that economists look at, uh, we don't see signs of a big structural problem. It seems cyclical. I, I said at the st start that people use measures of mismatch. They try to see whether uh, you know, the jobs are in particular industries, uh, whereas the unemployed are in other <coughs> industries and so on. So they try to look at mismatch indices of, for regions, for industries, for occupations. Uh, I, I've done uh, a study of this as well as many others, and we don't find that there was a there is a huge increase in mismatch. Uh, each of th these indices do tend to go up a bit at the st at the start of a recession, sometimes reflecting genuine problems. In the case of Europe, I think you know the, the housing boom in some uh, countries was adding a little bit of extra unemployment beyond what you might have expected uh, based on the demand decline. But these indices of mismatch after going up a little bit at the onset of the Great Recession, came back to uh, normal levels uh, pretty fast. So this is a second indicator that 
this is not a huge structural issue. And then the third thing that people uh, uh, sort of try to use as evidence, uh, so the third bullet there, um, is the fact that we haven't seen uh, much more deflation, uh, that inflation rates have not fallen more or we haven't seen outright deflation. And some people say that the fact that we haven't seen that is because uh, unemployment must be pretty close to its sort of natural rate. Uh, so the idea is if the economy was not close to potential, then all these unemployed resources would be exerting pre downward pressure on prices and prices should be falling a lot. So sometimes people say, well, if there really was so much, if demand was really so weak, if there were so many unemployed people uh, fighting for jobs who really wanted jobs and there were so many uh, companies who wanted to sell and they had you know, unsold inventories and so on, all this kind of slack in the economy should be putting downward pressure on prices and we don't see that. Uh, we have a very nice paper that was released of, I think last week in the World Economic Outlook, uh, chapter three of the World Economic Outlook, uh, it's called you know, the dog that didn't bark or something which says this is not what's going on. I mean, it's not as though you know, the, the slack is, uh, it is the reason that, uh, that, that there's so much slack that, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the chapter says that the lack of deflation should not be taken as a sign of a small unemployment gap. Okay. So, um, and it says that basically when inflation expectations are very well anchored as they have been over the past decade or 15 years, uh, then you know, people sort of grow to ex uh, expect that level of inflation and inflation will sort of remain at that level even if you have sort of large un unemployment gaps. So I would recommend that paper to you. So um, th these are the reasons we think unemployment in Europe is not structural, it's largely cyclical, the problem of uh, inadequate demand. And I have done some work, uh, this is the last bullet here, the stability of something called Oaken's Law, which is the relationship between growth and unemployment. I find uh, with my co-authors that this relationship is extremely stable it, will, it remains stable through the Great Recession, so that there's every uh, assurance based on this law, at least, that when growth returns, the jobs will return. So I'll uh, skip through this if you want the presentation. I can send it to you. This, this, this gives you the evidence that I mentioned that the beverage curve is pretty stable. Uh, this is my evidence on what I said was Oaken's law, which is that the relationship between the change in unemployment, which is what you see on one axis, and the change in incomes, which you see on the other axis, is very stable. So that, you know, it's unemployment is high where growth is low. So when growth comes back, unemployment will fall. That is what uh, this shows, and this relationship has held extremely well all through the Great Recession. So let me conclude with IMF advice. What have we advised? Uh, given that we think that the uh, advice is, is largely, uh, that the unemployment is largely cyclical, our focus has been on trying to bring uh, growth back through, through boosting demand. Uh, so that has been kind of the, the focus of the advice. And I have s some work uh, with my boss, Olivier Blanchard, and my colleague, uh, Florence Jamat, on looking at IMF advice. Uh, if you're interested, again, I can send you that paper. It's, it's on our website as well. Okay. So our, our recommendations have been focused on monetary fiscal policy. Uh, we advocated fiscal stimulus and monetary easing early on in the crisis. Uh, now we do indeed say that there should be fiscal consolidation given high levels of debt, but we have always emphasized it should be gradual and with credible medium-term plans, and that the effects of the fiscal consolidation should be off offset uh, to the extent it's possible by keeping monetary policy, continuing monetary policy uh, in kind of an easy stance by fixing the financial system so that credit is flowing again. And uh, I didn't, oh, okay, I did. So, and I think that this was uh, recognized over the last couple of days. I mean, uh, people in this town know that getting the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal to agree on anything is virtually impossible, but over the last two days, um, these papers have recognized our, our sort of leadership on, on, on fiscal issues. So the Post says that, uh, uh, the fund is uh, is giving up or has not sticking to its doctrinaire advocacy of monetary and fiscal restraint. We are asking you to work less and drink more. All right, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll buy you a drink after this. Uh, and then the 
Wall Street Journal says IMF renews push against austerity. And again, you can look at, so this is the Wall Street Journal article. It, it, it summarizes the advice we've given uh, over the last couple of days. We're asking the US and Britain to slow down. Uh, as the uh, Wall Street Journal says, their austerity measure. We've told the US that uh, it's doing sort of roughly the opposite of what we would ask it to do. It's front-loading adjustment and not having credible medium term. We wanted to have a credible medium term and not do anything <coughs> particularly that strong in the, in, the, uh, in, in the near term. So I mean, we would want, so we think it's going the wrong way. I mean, it should uh, not worry about bringing the deficit down right away, but worry more about having a credible medium term. We've uh, asked the UK to ease off a bit, uh, as shown in that next last slide. Um, uh, we've asked the Euro area policymakers, uh, you know, not to focus so much on nominal, <coughs> nominal targets. Uh, you may have seen seen that advice as well. Uh, we've called on Germany to uh, try to lift spending to stimulate its own economies and and its neighbors. So again, this all goes to the point one here that our, our advice has been largely on monetary and fiscal policy rather than on labor market policies because we think the problem is, is uh, weak demand. So that's been the focus. Um, and on labor market policies, uh, in some cases we've uh, advised extending unemployment benefits. In some cases it is true, we were, uh, such as in Portugal where we thought they were excessively generous, we have advice reduction. So it's not as though we are uh, always uh, doing things that may please you. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we think that you need targeted interventions uh, to help some groups, uh, youth, low-skilled, long-term unemployed. Uh, and we've come out against, at least in this uh, staff discussion note that uh, Olivier Blanchard uh, and I and Florence uh, Jamart wrote, we, we have advocated moving away from duality, which is the sort of system you have uh, in, in Spain, uh, for instance, where you have uh, a lot of workers being hired on temporary contracts and with very little employment protection, uh, we think that's created kind of a two-class uh, citizens among, among the labor market and this duality we've uh, advocated should, should be, uh, I mean, that, that Spain should, should move away from this. Okay. Okay, um, uh, I mean, there are indeed countries, I don't want to shy away from the fact that there are countries where we think the problem is one of restoring competitiveness, uh, and so uh, we have had to go ahead with pretty uh, tough measures in those countries in, uh, in trying to bring about reduction in relative wages. We've always made the point that, that this should ideally come about through a, a national tripartite agreement, but it has really not proven possible in, 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 in many cases or, or in any cases, frankly. Um, and without such an agreement, you're left with very, very unpalatable uh, options, uh, incurring the kinds of human costs that I talked about initially, that uh, you do have these huge increases in, in unemployment rate, which I think are, are just uh, tragic, tra tragic in their costs. And uh, again, there's also things that one can do to raise uh, medium run growth, but I think frankly the problem <coughs> is, is one of trying to uh, restore demand now, uh, restoring growth now so that you can bring unemployment rates down now and uh, you know, let the medium run uh, take care of itself. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Prakash. Mark, he took 25, so you get 25. Thank you. Oh, You're welcome. Did I really? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, hate, I hate to present the facts, but yes. <laughs> we always appreciate factual accuracy. Um, so where do I start on mine? I could use yours. I like <laughs> at least 90% of it. You know, that's why I say that it really isn't that much of a debate. And we've had this every year now. Uh, some of you have been here, it's in the same room. <laughs> Each year the European situation gets a little worse. And we do have some of the same arguments over policy, but um, in this case, uh, I didn't really find 
until we got to the last part, uh, you know, there might be some question. We might have some di differences over what the IMF has really recommended in Europe. If you want to summarize it, but I think I'm, I'm going to have a different emphasis. But I want to say I really appreciated uh, Prakash's presentation. I want to thank him also for participating, and thank Joe Marie for moderating, and uh, and all of you for coming here. And I think the um, I, well, I want to focus on something else because I think this is a, a oh, and I also want to thank you a lot for talking about the human cost of, of the unemployment because that's really to us the most important uh, thing. You know, these are relatively high income countries. Wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they didn't have that much income growth, but the unemployment is really devastating uh, to people's lives and the long term effects, which Prakash mentioned, I think are the most important thing. And I want to focus on the policy mistakes. Uh, that have led to and continue to uh, prolong this uh, situation. So, you know, a lot of you see in the, and I'm going to skip a lot of slides because it covered some stuff, but the uh, conventional wisdom, of course, this is a debt crisis, and so the countries borrow too much, and, you know, uh, therefore uh, they have to reduce debt and their, and their annual uh, deficits, uh, fiscal deficits, in order to get back to a sustainable debt level. And, you know, what I think most of us know, a lot of us here knows that actually this was brought out, this is really not a debt crisis, it was brought out by a uh, crisis uh, from the private sector, um, and there was bubble growth. And you know, it's, uh, Prakash mentioned that the, the forecast, the forecast, and I want to say without, I don't want to rub it in too much, but you know, over at CEPR, where we have about one thousandth of the research budget of the IMF, uh, we did in fact, uh, begin talking about the $8 trillion housing bubble in the United States that caused the Great Recession, which the IMF missed. It's the biggest asset bubble probably in, in, in world history. And uh, I think if they had noticed that, as well as the bubbles in, in Spain had an even bigger housing bubble than us, in the UK and Ireland, I think they would have had a different forecast uh, for those years. So I think that was a mistake. And there has been some, uh, you know, since the crisis, uh, there's been uh, reviews at the IMF, which you can read of their, their handling of the run-up uh, to the crisis. And so, yeah, so uh, anyway, this shows up in the borrowing, uh, which most of you know, uh, the uh, current account imbalances of these countries. Uh, what really happens is, you know, the recession uh, was led to the fiscal deficits. And uh, before, uh, and same thing, it's the same story in the United States, right? Our deficit is a result of collapse. Of, of aggregate demand. When you say debt to GDP, you're referring to public sector debt, right? Yeah, yes. Not private sector no, debt. No, no, I'm talking about the public use. sector because the standard, I mean, the implication you get from most media coverage is you have a public debt crisis in Europe. I'm trying to show that it's not. And here you can see Spain and Ireland were running fiscal surpluses. They had relatively low debt. I won't go through all of them, but here's Spain. You can see their net debt in 2007, if you could read it, uh, it would say uh, 26 Point seven percent of GDP, not very much. Even the other ones, you know, didn't have that much of it. At low interest rates, it was fine, and I'm going to get to that. And here you can see their fiscal uh, deficits, and Greece was the highest one, and uh, it actually hit 6.8 percent of GDP. But the others were not uh, terrible before the crisis. So now we're back in recession, five uh, quarters of negative growth in the eurozone. Uh, and I would argue that it's due to pro-cyclical policy. This is just a, a simple uh, graph of the relationship between uh, the austerity, the fiscal tightening, and uh, GDP growth. And you can see there's a, a reasonable relationship. And then you can see unemployment just hit a record level again, at 12 percent in the eurozone. We've <coughs> covered most of this. I want to say, though, it is kind of ironic. If you compare it to the U.S., you know, here are these governments that have big, they have much stronger trade unions, they have socialist parties, they have what you would consider a more developed uh, welfare state, and yet they have much more right-wing uh, fiscal and monetary policy than we have in the United States. And, uh, and of course, the, the result is uh, that they're doing much worse. I mean, 7.6% unemployment that we have is a lot better than 12. And uh, why is that? It's because, uh, well, it's, you know, I'll go into it, but basically it's because they have a central bank and the, the Troika, so I have to include the IMF in this because they sign off on these policies, even though, as Prakash shows, there are people within the fund 
who don't necessarily hold the view of the policies that are being implemented. But nonetheless, the Troika is, has caused this uh, horrible mess by, uh, by basically forcing uh, pro-cyclical policies uh, in, the, in the Eurozone area. And Greece, of course, is the worst case. You can see uh, structural balance was cut by 18.7%. This would be like, of GDP, this would be like cutting 2.9 trillion, or twice our fiscal deficit. Uh, over these four years, you could imagine what kind of a, a depression we would have here. And, uh, and as everybody now knows, uh, the IMF has had a couple of research uh, papers on it. The projections have been way off. Uh, these are the ones for the um, for Greece, and you can see from the fifth review uh, to the uh, that's the last dotted line to the latest review, which is a little over a year. Uh, they were off by around eight percent of GDP. It's quite an enormous difference, and the same thing here on unemployment. You can see a huge difference in, in unemployment uh, between nineteen. 19.5 and 26, over 26 percent on point. Can everyone hear Mark? <laughs> yeah, am I talking loud enough? Okay, there's a microphone too, but maybe I'm not close enough to it. So uh, these are these are the costs, some of the costs uh, for Greece, 21, 20.1 percent of GDP. And if you compare, uh, it says financial, I really meant economic crisis, but if you compare, you know, all the economic crises, uh, last century, this is still bad. It's as bad as almost anything except the Great Depression in the United States, maybe Argentina, uh, from 1998 to 2002, but it's, it's, it's very, very bad. And that's important because you, when you think of what are the alternatives, you, know, you think, hmm, what if they exited from the euro and devalued? Would that have been worse than this? Probably not. Almost certainly not. And uh, 20, you know, he already uh, forgot to show the unemployment rates. I think he had the April figures and all the, you know, mass layoffs, cuts to health and education. Privatization is not going that far right now. That's taking a while. Um, and, you know, we mentioned some of the other social costs. This is some of the, you know, health indicators, um, rise in suicide rates, violence, HIV. Uh, here's the employment as a share of working age population still falling very low. Um, so what is the strategy here? If you can't get out of the euro, it is an internal devaluation strategy. And the way it has to work, of course, is that you push down uh, costs, primarily labor costs, but prices too, maybe. Um, in, uh, and uh, you are able to uh, recover through a current account a surplus, trade surplus. Uh, despite the uh, fiscal uh, tightening and the inability to use monetary policy, which they don't have because of the European Central Bank. And, uh, but the problem is here's the real effective exchange rate, and you can see it measured by the Consumer Price Index. That's the top line. <coughs> it actually hasn't fallen at all. By the unit labor costs, it's fallen some from its uh, peak, but still nothing nearly enough to get you the export boom uh, that you would need to get out of this, mm -hmm. given the massive, uh, uh, massive losses in aggregate demand caused by the uh, fiscal tightening and the spending cuts. Um, the debt haircut didn't do them much good. Um, I should say, though, uh, there is one important change that's been made in, uh, in the last um, agreement with the Troika. They lowered the current uh, interest payments on the debt to about 3% of GDP. So in that sense, and temporarily at least, until it comes back, uh, there it is uh, sustainable right now. And the problem is, of course, they're still pursuing the austerity, so they can't get out of their recession. But that part was a significant advance. They just need to reverse the fiscal policies primarily. Um, and you can see, again, there was the prior interest burden for Greece, 6.8% of GDP, so that's a big change. But, you know, interest burdens uh, in the EU were not uh, terrible, and, uh, you know, net interest burdens. Um, here I just wanted to mention the effect of the Troika on, on the world economy. You can see how the world economy has slowed 
uh, I'm not attributing all of this to the crisis in Europe, but some of it certainly is. Um, and you can see how the IMF has had to lower its uh, projections consistently uh, from a year ago, 4.1, now down to 3.3 percent growth uh, for 2013 for world economic growth. You have about uh, 200 million people unemployed, so the whole world economy is really uh, suffering as a result of these, uh, these bad policies. Now here's something that may be a little more controversial, and that is, you know, how do we explain this? You know, what are they, what are they doing? And I'm arguing, and I think there's a lot of evidence for it, that the Troika actually sees this crisis as an opportunity to uh, remake the European social contract. And I'll, I'll give you some evidence in a minute, but so you have all these reforms that have been implemented. And, uh, you know, so what you have to understand here is that the, the Troika, including the ECB, could at any time in the last three years really put a, an end into the acute uh, crisis uh, simply by stabilizing uh, from primarily, most importantly, the Italian and Spanish bond market. They had all these recurring crises, and they wouldn't do it. And you can see that they, you know, it was kind of unnerving for them, right? I mean, they, they're trying to strike a balance between maintaining this pressure on the governments to do the things that, uh, you know, the cuts in minimum wages and the change in labor laws in Spain, for example, that we can collect the bargaining, the pension cuts, the health care cuts. You know, they're trying to force them to do all these things that they would never vote for. Uh, but on the other hand, it's kind of nightmarish for them, too, because they don't want a, the whole thing to blow up in their face. And uh, here's an example, just, I just picked one of a lot that you can find in the press, where you can see uh, this was from uh, uh, the most senior German at the European Central Bank, said it was uh, crucial to ensure that ECB decisions, uh, that's when they were talking about stabilizing the Spanish and Italian bonds, did not reduce pressure on governments to reform. Okay? That was the tension for them all the time. And then finally, well, we'll get to this at the end. You'll see that Draghi finally uh, changed the position of the ECB, and, and that made a, a big difference. Here's another thing, by the way, that I think contradicts a little of what Prakash uh, went through on IMF policy advice, and you're familiar with our paper, and we thank you for reading it and commenting on it. Um, the, uh, did you comment? <coughs> yeah, um, so we looked at 67... Uh, Article 4 agreements for the four years from 2008 to 2011, and we found a consistent pattern of policy recommendations. One, macroeconomic policy uh, advice that focuses on reducing spending and shrinking the size of government, in many cases regardless of whether this is appropriate or necessary, or may even exaggerate the economic downturn. And I'm not saying they didn't in some cases support stimulus, like in the beginning in Spain, for example. But this was the overall pattern that we saw in 67 agreements. And two, a focus on other policy issues that would, uh, recommendations that would tend to reduce social protections for broad sectors of the population, including public pensions, health care, and employment protection. Things that would tend to reduce labor share of national income and possibly increase poverty, social exclusion, and economic and social inequality as a result. That was our conclusion from reading uh, all the policy recommendations and, and uh, tabling them, looking at them, <coughs> counting them up uh, over this four-year period uh, in Europe. You didn't take my red line suggestions to drop that, I see. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and um, if you look at the history, you can see, you know, uh, for the last three years, we've been following very closely on kind of a daily basis. You can see, you know, you have these recurring crises, and each time the Troika is, you know, moves to something they said they weren't going to do, beginning with, you know, we didn't want a haircut, we didn't want to uh, uh, intervene in the bond markets, we didn't want to do it. And they keep moving. There were eight aid packages, each increasing in size from May 2010 to December 2011. But the truth is, something they could have resolved back in 2010 when the Greek problem first arose with a very small amount of money uh, became an enormous problem. That, to me, is a policy mistake of, uh, how should I say it, gigantic proportions. And Draghi was different, of course. Uh, I did mention the long-term <coughs> refinancing operation, uh, a trillion dollars for the banks. Um, 
And uh, nonetheless, they still pushed Europe back into recession. Again, a big difference from what happened in the United States, where we have a central bank that has to be a little bit accountable to the general public. Uh, and I think uh, that's why, you know, a lot of emphasis, a lot of people emphasize the financial markets and pressure from the financial markets. But I think it was very clear, if you followed it, that the ECB at every single point had the power very easily and with not very much money, uh, nothing like what the Fed used, uh, to, to overpower the financial markets in any of the sovereign bond markets and just didn't want to do it for the reasons that I uh, mentioned. And here, how much time I got? You have a full 15 minutes unless you want for, for Gosh to respond. Oh, he'll get a chance. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, good. Because I want to show also that there are alternatives to this. Um, obviously, the most obvious, the most obvious alternative is the ECB and the European authorities could change course and allow for expansionary fiscal policy in Greece and in the Eurozone, and they won't do that. That would be the best alternative. And you know, the ECB can create money. In fact, the ECB has created something the same order of money that the Federal Reserve has created, you know, two uh, trillion, two, more than two trillion dollars since 2008. Uh, but it, none of it, almost none of it went to the uh, public sector. Very, very little of it, I should say, almost none, but very little. And in the U U.S., of course, it was used to, for quantitative easing and to keep very low long-term interest rates and mortgage rates and everything else. And really also to give the government fiscal space if it needed it, if it wanted to use it, which unfortunately, as Prakash pointed out, it's not um, right now. But, uh, you know, here's one option, the Argentine option, uh, which is default and exit. Um, and I just want to emphasize how successful this was. Uh, and uh, some of the reasons it was successful, which are commonly not understood. Uh, you know, they, they only had one quarter of continued recession after the default and the devaluation. And then they grew quite rapidly, 63% over the next six years. Uh, within three years, they recovered the pre-crisis GDP. That's compared to, you look at what it's going to take uh, the Eurozone countries like Greece or Spain to get, you're talking about a decade or maybe more. Um, to get back to the pre-crisis GDP, unless we have some upside surprises, which are possible. Uh, the, uh, they, obviously, they benefited enormously from it, too, in terms of poverty reduction. Um, and uh, it was a huge success, no matter how you look at it, for at, at least up to the world recession, and then uh, for at least a year or two after that. And we'll see what happens now. Uh, and here you can see the growth path that I'm talking about, between the difference between Argentina and the projected growth path for Greece if things go according to plan from the IMF. Um, now, some things to emphasize because they're widely misunderstood. The Argentine growth was not a commodities boom. If you look at the actual uh, contributions to growth, uh, commodities played very little role in the entire expansion from uh, 2002 to 2008. It wasn't even an export-led recovery. So that's misunderstood because most people think that the key thing comes from the devaluation, right? When you get out, when you devalue your currency, or if you were to exit the euro, you'd be able to have a, a cheap currency and you'd be able to export your way out. That isn't the main thing. The main thing that Argentina got from getting out of that system and getting out from the IMF agreements that were part of that system was the ability to change their fiscal and monetary policy as well as their exchange rate policy. And there were other things as well. A lot of money came back into the country. Uh, and that would happen in Greece, for example. As soon as the economy stabilized, you would see a lot of money come back into Greece as well. So the change in macroeconomic policy uh, from a pro-cyclical policy to a pro-growth policy was the key, and that is what these countries are being uh, restricted from, from doing. Um, the, uh, Greece actually has twice the export sector that Argentina had, more, uh, you know, more potential sources of borrowing if they needed it, in a much more uh, developed economy and banking system than, than, than Argentina had uh, back in 2002. So a lot of advantages. Here you can see exports as a percent of GDP for Argentina uh, in um, 2001. Now, of course, that changed uh, with the devaluation, but it would also change in Greece. So the relevant comparison 
-hmm. between 2001 in Argentina and uh, 2011 in Greece. Greece has a much bigger advantage in terms of increasing, uh, getting a boost from, from exports too. Spain, we talked about, uh, Prakash talked about a little bit. I just wanted to emphasize that their, uh, their debt burden is manageable. First, I'll show you the last five quarters of growth. They've been in recession, unemployment at 26%. Here's something, a very uh, striking fact I think it's important for people to know. Uh, the IMF's latest Article 4 agreement shows that Spain, even after it recovers and reaches almost its whole uh, potential GDP, according to the IMF estimate, in 2017, they still have 20.5% unemployment. So there's something really wrong uh, with that picture. Uh, again, uh, that to me would favor uh, uh, considering a, a, an exit from the euro and different kind of economy. Here is the interest payments. Not too horrible so far. Uh, projected to get worse, but you know, not a terrible uh, interest uh, profile uh, in terms of the interest on the debt. So the main problem, again, is not a <coughs> problem. Now, conclusion. Um, sorry if that was too fast. <laughs> but you can ask questions uh, in the question and answer. Um, here's something that happened. I think there was a big change uh, last fall when Draghi uh, made some statements indicating that they would stabilize Italian and Spanish uh, bond interest rates. And this, I think, uh, really did put an end to the recurring acute crises, at least for now, uh, where bad things can still happen. But I think that really uh, did it uh, for that part of it. And so, I don't know why they did that. I think, personally, I think that Draghi got tired of the near-death experiences. I think also there was pressure after 12 so governments had lost power. And I, 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 I want to emphasize that that's, you know, that's what's the tragedy of Europe, in the Eurozone, is that you know, we didn't have to go through what they're going through because we didn't give up our uh, control over uh, the three most important uh, uh, policies, uh, fiscal, monetary, and exchange rate. Okay? Uh, we have our own uh, central bank and our own uh, currency. So, you know, I don't think the euro is a bad idea in necessarily in, in, in theory, but if you're going to give up your national sovereignty over the most important uh, questions, uh, most important policy tools, uh, you better make sure that you're giving it to people that you can really trust. And unfortunately, they gave it to the wrong people and the wrong institutions led by the European Central Bank. These were people who had a whole different agenda, and it was all fine while everything was growing, uh, but as soon as you really need to change course, as soon as you really need those expansionary policies, you're just completely screwed because there they were with a whole different agenda, not interested uh, for at least a few years in getting you out of recession, but interested in forcing these unpopular uh, policy changes. And again, I want to make my disclaimer about the IMF that I make each year in this same room. <laughs> that the IMF is the subordinate partner of the Troika, and so uh, I don't uh, know that Prakash has to make this plea, but if I were him, I would make the plea that they're not really responsible for the policies in Europe, or they have limited responsibility in the Eurozone at least, uh, because of the fact that they don't, you know, they, there are European governors and directors uh, on the board of the IMF, and they're really, uh, I think, making the decisions. So, uh, on the other hand, they do sign off on this stuff, and we do have those Article 4 agreements which don't indicate a very good uh, uh, track record on, on policy issues from, from my point of view. Um, so, this is, uh, this is really the big difference. You know, we have an independent central bank here, too, but it does have some accountability. Uh, the, the, the chair of the Fed, 
uh, Ben Bernanke has to come to Congress regularly and testify, and he can get some heat. And more than that, you know, last year the House passed by a huge margin uh, an audit of the Fed for the first time. It's being blocked because the Fed is very powerful and the people that support it are very <coughs> powerful um, in this country. It's being blocked in the Senate. But nonetheless, that's enough to make the Fed think about how unpopular they want to be in this country because they could lose uh, some of that independence. So there's very, uh, for my opinion, too weak uh, mechanisms of accountability, but something that gr you know grossly exceeds anything you have in the in the eurozone. So I think that explains a lot of the difference between the situation that we face in the United States, which I think is still terrible and inexcusable. Uh, you know, we have actually you know, over 20 million people right now uh, who are unemployed, uh, underemployed or uh, given up looking uh, for work. Um, uh, but nonetheless, not as bad as Europe, which has still, I think, not light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, what's going to happen, I think that if you don't have, if nobody's got a credible threat to leave the Euro, and you don't have that, I mean, I was just in Spain, there's no, uh, there's almost no debate about it. And again, I don't have a position really to say, and I'm not an advisor in any government, you know, you should leave the euro. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that as a practical matter, you can love the euro or you can hate it. But if they don't have a credible threat to leave, you know, the pressure is a very, very slow pressure. In other words, there is a pressure. You can see it happening. You know, it doesn't government's fault. And <laughs> Draghi finally decides to stabilize the interest rates on European uh, and, and on Italian and Spanish bonds. But what about the austerity? How long is it going to take for that? How long are they going to have mass unemployment that, with all the human co costs that uh, Prakash described? Until somebody says, you know, we're going to leave if you don't change this, it's going to be, I think, unfortunately, a very long, slow process until the Troika is forced to retreat uh, from its uh, current policies. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> You'll forgive me, I cut Mark just a little bit shy in order to give Prakash his time to respond because he has to go keep his job. And we are for full employment in this room. And especially of him. <laughs> so, Prakash? Uh, thanks very much. I, I, I think that was a very uh, nice presentation. I have not all that much to disagree with. I just want to maybe make a few points uh, and start with one uh, point, which is, uh, yes, I'm expressing my own views, but it, you shouldn't uh, think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm some uh, lone gun in the, in the basement there. But uh, <laughs> so uh, I think uh, a lot of the stuff that I, uh, I expressed is something that uh, our management and uh, our chief economist have said. So for instance, uh, Christine Lagarde yesterday, in a, uh, last week in a speech, said there is a need for higher demand in countries with big trade surpluses. For countries in Northern Europe, like Germany, she said, it means doing more to boost investment. So I mean, everything that I've sketched out is, is sort of within the, the broad uh, view of the institution. I just meant that you shouldn't take literally the way I've expressed it as, as, as uh, necessarily being the way the IMF might uh, choose to express it in, in, in their official uh, uh, pronouncements. So I think what I've sketched out is 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 the broad view that uh, we do think that sort of as the Wall Street Journal said, uh, IMF renews push against austerity. That is their headline, but I think uh, certainly everything we've said over the last few days uh, is is in that direction. Um, I, I think that the other point I want to to make is. Uh, <coughs> You know, Mark very kindly offered me this out of saying that we are the junior partner in the Troika, and so uh, maybe we are not as culpable. I mean, I think that you, you do have to recognize that there are many uh, people at, at uh, many different institutions at play in this, uh, in, in, in this game in, in Europe in, in, the, in designing the programs. And plus, uh, people are choosing, as Mark said, many, many countries are choosing to, to do this themselves through elections. I mean, nobody's accusing uh, Cameron of uh, 
of fixing things to uh, to get his way. I mean, he he, he put to the the people of Britain what he told them what he was going to do. He said he said I'm going to have a policy of austerity, and he was elected on that basis. So it's not we can't really say that this is just some. Uh, democracy being usurped or something. People are making these choices given the situation that they face and uh, their view on, on how best to get out of it. So I think we have to respect that process. Um, the third thing I wanted to say was uh, I agree with Mark that you know the euro is, is not a bad idea in theory. Um, we all know that it's, it's a political project. It, it comes from the terrible history of the world wars and the desire of people there to to unite and to form uh, you know, a, a union in a way that would be lasting and not lead to uh, the kinds of conflicts they had. And But we've also known that for a currency union to survive, you need many other institutional support mechanisms. You need a fiscal union, you need a banking union, uh, and so on. You need labor mobility across the countries. And Unfortunately, it just so happened that all these that the crisis hit before these institutional structures could be put in place. Uh, it's not as though anything uh, has come as a surprise. Uh, all the literature that we have on optimum currency areas tells us that we need these institutions in order for for a currency union to survive, and the U.S. has these institutions, and that's why the U.S. currency union survives. So, I, I, I agree with. The bottom line that the euro is not a bad idea. It, uh, th these structures are being put in place, and and it can succeed. It is in uh, imposing these costs, uh, particularly on countries like Greece, which have to mm -hmm. do this really wrenching uh, adjustment. Um, so I mean, I think that my bottom line is not to advocate kind of this Argentina default and exit strategy for for them, uh, but I do agree that given the situation that they are in, whereas, which is that they want to be part of a currency union and the supporting structures are just now being put in place, that there is unfortunately a very uh, wrenching adjustment that they're going through with all, with all the human costs in terms of unemployment. So, stop. Thank you so much. Okay, does anyone have one burning question? For Prakash. Um, Who are you? I'm Larry, I would give me a chance to say, I'm Larry Elliott <laughs> of The Guardian. Um, is um, the suggestion that a country should leave the euro off limits for the fund? Because a normal IMF, if, this was not, if, if Greece was not in the euro, a normal IMF structural adjustment package would involve a big four in its nominal exchange rates plus some austerity, so that you get a big four in the real exchange rate. I mean, the, the slides have shown that these countries are not getting a real four in their real exchange rate because their because their normal exchange rate can't fall. And, and, and I just wonder, you know, why is it that the, the fund is not saying that some of these countries might actually be better off outside Euro? Because they quite, some of them quite clearly would be, or certainly much more, uh, much more of a, you know, an even an even question than, than you would need to be here. It seems to be completely off limits. So I just wonder whether the fund has been told, you can't say this. You know, the other members of the Troika are saying, you cannot possibly say this because it's just going to turn it. Prakash, there's one other person yes. with a question for you. I'm going to combine them for you so you can just do one answer. Yes, sir? Hi, there. Yes, I'm, I'm from Spain. And some of the, many of the things that I've heard here resonate and, of course, are absolutely true. Uh, there's one point that we in Spain know very, very much about, a lopsided currency union like we have in Europe. I mean, there were very, very low real interest rates at the beginning of the European Monetary Union, which of course favored getting Germany out of recession while the periphery was in boom, and that of course built up the bubble in great part. Now, governments could have taken action at that time to resist this, to offset this. They did not, perhaps because of the political coloring of the parties that were in, in office at that moment in time, instead of running much larger surpluses than they did, they did not. And this has a bearing on the situation today. Uh, whether we want to go out of the euro or not, time will tell. I'll go that far with Mark. However, there is one issue which I think is terribly important, which is missed by the IMF, 
and by many others, but that civil society in Spain brings to the fore, and where many Spaniards are hoping that at least by being a member of uh, a club that requires following certain rules will engender change. And that is understanding the terrific costs of decentralization of the democracy in Spain and the creation of 17 new autonomous community governments with duplicate spending in 17 new governments. The Spanish public sector passed from having 1 million public civil servants in the late 70s to more than 3.3 million today. For an economy with an active labor force of 17 million, it's quite a burden. To put things into perspective, relative to Germany, which has twice the population of Spain, we're talking about an economy that has more public civil servants than they do. The point here is, what does the IMF do in terms of pressing a country when it knows that part of the structural public sector deficit that it has is due to duplicate spending, duplicate costs, Thank unnecessary? You. Thanks. Okay, Prakash, I want to protect your time, but um, answer their question. Uh, on Larry's question, I mean, I think that despite the, the, the power the IMF is sometimes rumored to have, I think on exchange rates, uh, we certainly uh, don't have, don't feel that we are in the position to advise countries on their exchange rate regime. That's very much sort of stated that we take the exchange rate regime that the country has mm -hmm. chosen as given. What we can do is to say, given that this is the choice of your exchange rate regimes, this has to be the constellation of other policies that you need in order to have that exchange rate regime. So we can point out uh, conflicts between poli other policies that, may, that they may have chosen, which may, may not allow them to maintain that exchange rate regime. But that's really as far as, as we can go. So uh, even if we were not part of a troika, uh, just operating on our own, we would never for instance, advise a country to break an exchange rate peg if that was the chosen exchange rate that regime. That does mean that the internal devaluation has to be pretty prolonged and pretty severe, doesn't it? If there's no, if there's no fall in the, in the normal exchange rate, then in order to get the equivalent fall in the real exchange rate just through yeah, I, I, the wages and prices, that has to be a, a really quite brutal process. Yeah, I, I wish the answer was no, but yeah, I think that that, 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 is, that is a huge cost that, that countries impose have to take when, when they decide to be part of a currency union. I, I should say that uh, some adjustment is taking place in Greece. The very most recent evidence, <coughs> the numbers that we've crunched, but you know, we, we're really uh, it's not as though it's something that that ends soon. And uh, just quickly on on on, on Marx, uh, the, the numbers that you put up on Spain, uh, the potential. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the, the, the natural rate of unemployment, the long-term unemployment, still being 20% in 2017. That's something I think we'll, uh, I'll go back and talk with, with the teams. That's uh, as part of my uh, job as, as the co-chair of the Jobs and Growth Working Group. That's one thing that we want our country teams to to look at is, you know, what long-run projections are you making for potential GDP and long-term long-term unemployment? Are those consistent? Um, and if you are making a projection of 20% long-run unemployment for a country, maybe you need to sort of think seriously about that and tell the authorities, you know, this is not, this is not a good, uh, not a good, not a good plan to be going to. Okay, and the answer to the gentleman about uh, civil oh, service? Oh, oh, yeah, on the, on, on, well, first on, on the housing bubbles, I mean, yeah, it's, you're right, as Mark said, I mean, uh, we, we sort of missed along with many observers, except uh, Dean Baker, uh, <laughs> the housing bubble. I, I, I heard that Dean sort of sold his house uh, mm -hmm. at the right time and got out. <laughs> so, um, Smart man. Yeah. I, the, the irony is that we had actually been following the housing sector pretty closely. So if you actually look at our world economic outlook, there were several chapters no, that kind of, <laughs> kind of flirting with the idea of that there was something going on. But at, the, at that critical moment, we, we didn't. Uh, Call it, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. In Spain too, I, I think that one of the lessons from the crisis will be that even if you think that central banks don't have the ability to uh, detect or prick bubbles, I mean, certainly you have to be much more alert and you know much more 
communicate much more about the possible dangers of asset price bubbles. So I think any responsible central bank uh, is going to start doing that. Uh, on, on public spending, I mean, I think we have in 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 a number of these programs uh, indeed recommended uh, downsizing of, of public sectors where we consider them outsized. So well, Spain just got a huge employment boost. Thank you so much, Prakash. We know you have to go keep your job. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next year if you're still employed. <laughs> um, okay, now questions for Mark, please. Yes, ma'am. I do have five minutes. So oh, you do on. have five more minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. I'll, I'll wait and hear okay. Mark. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mark. Who are you? Yeah, my name is Ingrid Raymond, and I'm working for the Norwegian Church Aid. Mm -hmm. uh, in that, and I'm also a local representative in the City Council of Oslo. Mm -hmm. And both of my work, working with developing countries and working with politics of Oslo, and working with the same issue, how to reduce inequality, economic inequality in developing countries and also in Oslo. It's many times actually pretty much the same. Uh, so my question looking upon Europe, it would be uh, and the European crisis, it's the danger of inequality uh, increasing in Europe. You have massive unemployment and at the same time you're cutting off the social network or the social safety net for the people and that's especially uh, a danger for those without work. <coughs> so my question for both of you, maybe one of you are going, but if you could comment a bit uh, on the possibility to tax redistribution in at the moment and how to, because there are other alternatives to how to cut, cut the cost. You could either uh, have tax redistribution or you could cut uh, the welfare state. Uh, so I, I wonder if you could comment on, on this issue because I haven't heard so much about that topic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mark and then Prakash. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's obviously a very important thing. Uh, you even had more in the United States uh, since, you know, most recently in terms of uh, changing the income tax code in a slightly, I would say precise slightly, uh, progressive uh, change, you know, the increase in taxes on the upper uh, one or two percent um, than you had in Europe. Um, although it varies by country. I think in Italy they had some increases in taxes. Uh, they, their fiscal tightening was, uh, was a significant part of it. But then you had big increase in the value added tax in Spain, which is highly regressive. I, I think, you know, to be fair to the IMF, they do think that rich people should pay taxes, uh, which is, you know, partly why the Wall Street Journal has never liked them, and the Wall Street Journal editorial board, I should say. Um, <laughs> And, you know, in Greece, they have, you know, I didn't mention it, but, you know, most of Greece's, most if not all of Greece's fiscal problems before and, and slightly after the crisis began, now it's, of course, a horrible mess, but uh, it could have been resolved simply by getting the rich people to pay their taxes. And the IMF, if you read their agreements with the Greece, they're for it and they're emphasizing it. But, this is a slow process. There's courts involved in this. There's laws that, you know, it's not so easy. And that's why it's so horrible what they're doing in Greece and what the Troika is doing, because they could have resolved this problem gradually, uh, primarily through an increase in, in revenue of that sort. The tax evasion is enormous in Greece. And so, yeah, and you're absolutely right about the income distribution. I mean, you know, there's a, plenty of research showing you have higher unemployment rates increases in inequality and you have a weakening of the social safety net too in most countries uh, as a, you know, since the recession. Okay, I'm going to ask you to hold. There are three people with their hands up in this neighborhood. Yes, one, now two, and who is the third person? Three. Okay, okay, one, two, three. Well, it was for five years since I've been good, yes. but I'm, I'm Sandrine Rastello from Bloomberg. I was just wondering, first of all, when you say you don't recommend things on, on pegs on exchange rate, isn't that what you were recommending in Latvia? To drop the peg and let them devalue their currency? So I thought, isn't that the case that you recommend sometimes? But my question was actually, what would you say you've learned from the Troika? And has this shown in, say, the latest bailout in Cyprus? Did you, you know, learn things and were reacting differently with the other partners of the Troika? 
Okay, the next question, gentleman here with pink shirt, Pur sure. light purple. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Jeff Oaken Kozlowicki, I have a question for Mark. Um, in, if we use Argentina as a success story, um, I think we have to take into account the lasting damage to the international reputation caused by the default and the way the default was carried out. I, I wonder if, in arguing that this is a good option for Greece, are you, are you saying that the damage to Greece's reputation is already there and that um, getting out and throwing in the towel, so to speak, would, wouldn't uh, make the problem worse? And um, related to that, in using Argentina to success story, I think we have to look at the global commodities boom. Even though there was certainly some growth in domestic investment and consumption, I think the, the low base that they were coming from, that their, 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 their huge drop in GDP meant that 36% is a little less impressive. The 63. The 63, rather. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, Sargon? Um, Sargon from the Fred and Woods Project. Uh, I'm at the World Bank Watchdog. Uh, my question is, <clears throat> can we go further in the um, uh, examination of the relationship between the IMF as an enabler of the ECB? Uh, an interesting paper by uh, economic advisor to the Indian Prime Minister, Alok Shield, in um, Economic and Political Weekly back in January, set this argument out very clearly, and it has two really interesting dimensions. One is the increasing um, and, uh, and vociferous criticism from developing countries about the fact that inadvertently and perhaps in a, indirectly, poorer people in the world are subsidizing the EU's lack of willingness or incapability to, to the Eurozone, excuse me, address those problems. And secondly, to, to expand on that, how much is the IMF's acquiescence and involvement in the Troika effectively rubber stamping the fact that a uh, central bank which prints hard currency therefore has resources which dwarf anything the IMF could ever hope to have, um, is basically allowing the ECB to take this stance as you put it. Okay, quickly, quickly. Very quickly. Isabel. Not going so far, uh, just to remind the audience that in February 2010 there were two papers published by uh, IMF. Uh, um, uh, they were ex exiting from crisis intervention policies and uh, strategies for fiscal consolidation in the post-crisis world. Therefore, February 2010, they were focused in Europe, uh, though the, the kind of message spread you know, to the rest of the world. And actually, as we are talking now, about 119 countries you know, um, contracting uh, the public expenditures. But meaning, uh, it's official, huh? so on the papers. Your turn. This, yeah, is, I mean, this is your. Yeah, this is my last minute, so I won't be able to. <laughs> Luckily. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the question at the back there, I mean, as Mark said, we, you know, we have uh, advocated uh, you know, using, using the tax instrument as, as much as possible. I mean, in fact, our managing director got in some trouble initially by, when she said people should pay their taxes in Greece. Uh, <laughs> That's true. And, uh, and you know, as you said, that we have pushed for uh, for uh, sort of somewhat more progressive taxes. We've been in favor of a financial uh, transactions tax, and uh, so I think to the extent we can, we, we have been in favor of that. Um, on the question on, on, on Latvia, I mean, I think that uh, I think the the position is as I expressed it, which is we can point out to a country the difficulties of. Um, maintaining a certain exchange rate policy unless the constellation of other policies is aligned, and I think that's what we did in the case of Latvia as well. I don't think uh, the record will show anything different. Uh, yeah, no, I think I'll, I'm just going to dodge the question. <laughs> about the Troika, and I'm sorry, but I have to leave. <laughs> oh, it's too bad to have to leave. You just skirted by the, the tricky one. Okay, thanks so much for that. on the questions already on the floor and then we'll keep going? Yeah. We have 10 minutes. There's a lot of you. We wrote a few papers on them, so I did read through all the IMF papers on them, and I, so I can, I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> For the IMF. Uh, well, yeah. Hurry up, get out those, so you don't hear. Yeah. If you read those papers carefully, you can see 
that the IMF really didn't like uh, the idea of keeping the peg. Uh, and they kind of said, they, they came very, very close to saying that they couldn't really say that because that was the official policy. And in my opinion, it was dictated a lot by the European Commission and particularly the Swedish banks who didn't want a devaluation because it would have been huge losses. But through those papers, you can kind of tell that the IMF realized that the costs were going to be huge uh, of maintaining the peg exchange rate. And I think if they were an independent entity, they probably would have supported a, a devaluation. But that, I can't say that for sure because they never said that strictly. But I, if you look at our papers, I footnoted the parts that kind of strongly imply that. And, you know, uh, so, uh, but it was devastating and it was a terrible thing. Uh, you know, they lost 18% uh, of uh, GDP, more than 18% of GDP in, in two years. And it's one of the worst, it was the worst in the whole world economic crisis. And a big mistake, in my opinion. And they're still suffering from it. A lot of people have left the country, of course, and that lowered the unemployment rate a little bit. Um, but it's, it's still very high. Um, the, um, uh, what Isabel said about, yeah, the, the IMF, a lot of the IMF statements on Europe are, uh, are, are a matter of public record. So <laughs> they, they did support uh, a lot of the fiscal tightening. They do go back and forth some, but you know, uh, Blanchard, uh, Olivier Blanchard was in the, the press today saying that the U.S. does need some of this fiscal tightening right now. Uh, and uh, so, you know, he, he did also say that we would lose one and a half to two percentage points of GDP as a result of this well, the tightening we're having, but he did say some of it is necessary, so how much? I don't know. But he's made a whole lot of those kinds of public statements that contradict, to me, very much his own writings and, the, and some of the better uh, papers from the fund. Um, so, uh, you know, they do have this research. The research is changing. I see that as progress but the policy does not seem to change that much. I like your point very much of the IMF as an enabler uh, to the ECB, yeah. I mean, it is kind of a pretense, right? I mean, why do they have to borrow money? Why do these uh, countries have to borrow money from the IMF and, or from the European Financial Stability Facility or anywhere else where it adds to their, uh, their net debt when they could do what the U.S. has done in the past uh, couple of years um, and you, you can add to your uh, gross debt and not your net debt because the ECB is perfectly capable of resolving this. And they just won't do it. This is what I, this is, you know, I think the most, the, the major point that I was making. On the Argentine success story and the damage to reputation of commodities, you may not have been here, but I, I, I pointed out that the commodities had very little to do with the growth from 2002 to 2008. 88% uh, of the growth was, to, you know, as a matter of counting was uh, due to domestic investment and consumption. Not percentage points, but 88% of the total. So that was, uh, that was a, uh, it, it just wasn't a commodities boom. That's something that people say all the time, but it just wasn't uh, true. Now, is the damage to reputation important? Well, I don't want to uh, throw that out completely. Although, if you read Reinhardt and Rogoff's uh, book, uh, The History of, of you know, Debt and Falsy, yeah, I, you know, they're pretty conservative on that issue, and they think you should go suffer a lot in order to maintain your reputation. But historically, uh, you don't see countries paying a huge uh, price generally uh, for defaults because most investors and lenders are forward-looking, and they're going to look at uh, what's the ability to pay in the future and not, so, not as much what they did in the past. The business press often has a different attitude. They want punishment. But uh, the, uh, I think the lenders are not as bad. Uh, obviously, Argentina has paid a price. They haven't been able to borrow on international markets very much. Uh, but, you know, if you ask me, I mean, would I rather take a record? I mean, why do people declare bankruptcy, you know, in the United States when they can't pay their debts? It's because their reputation is a little less important than their survival. Um, and I think that is even much more true at the uh, national level when it comes to sovereign debt. Um, Do you want more questions or just? Well, I wanted to address a couple of other things that people said. On the, uh, the Spanish uh, public servants, 
That's about 19. If you're, those numbers you said were right, and I don't know because I haven't checked them recently, that's about 19% of the labor force. That isn't tremendously high. Uh, it's higher in the United States, uh, but it's a lot lower than some of the northern European countries in terms of the percentage of the labor force that's working for the public sector. I mean, I think some of the Scandinavian countries are in the high 20s, as high as 29. France is somewhere in the, I can't remember, it's, it's 20s, close to mid-20s. It's the starting point. If you're starting from about 1.1 1, 1. 1 million, and then you move up to 3.3 .3 in a 20-year period of time, it's a lot. No, if it were to yeah, if it were continue increasing at in that pace, it could be a problem. Um, the other thing about the structural problems that people talked about within the Eurozone, um, well, let me just, one, one, one point, because we were supposed to respond to each other. I want to just respond to one point that Prakash made about people doing this through elections. I think there's some truth to that, but, you know, if you look at it, first of all, look at all these governments that fell, okay? <laughs> that was a result of people not liking it. Now, if it so happens that they have a two-party system like ours, and they end up with the Pepe in, in Spain instead of the Pessoe because the Pessoe had a horrible austerity that they were angered people. Well, you can say that was an electoral choice, but they went from the frying pan to the fire. Absolutely. And, uh, so it is partly uh, a result, largely a result, in a lot of these countries of Europe-wide decisions that are not allowing these countries to get out of recession. So I think they cannot escape that. Okay, we have this man is persistent, and how many others have burning questions? Very quickly. Okay, one, two, three, four, very fast, rapid fire. Okay, Go for thank it. Thank you. My name is Olyan Jukic, I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina. So Bosnia and Herzegovina aspires to enter the EU, and uh, aspires it very much. I'm, I'm so surprised that we haven't had any public dialogue whether it should, should or shouldn't do that. Uh, we have higher unemployment rates than, than uh, Spain and higher public sector employment than, than in Spain. So we have very, very much, we are in bad shape. Uh, we have a fixed exchange rate, so we are fixed to, to, to uh, we have currency board fixed to the euro. So my, my question is just what is your view on that and should we... Uh, Are you talking about the Eurozone or the EU? You're talking about entering the Eurozone? Uh, the, the, we, well, the first, 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 first step is entering the EU, then the right. Eurozone. So, so they want to enter the Eurozone? Yes. yes. Okay. Croatia, our neighbor, is entering the, in the middle of the, of the next, of this year. Okay, who is next? Okay, as soon as you said fast, my brain froze. So. <laughs> Um, in historical context of how these countries got to be part of the Eurozone, I was just wondering about some of your conclusions if they if you looked at that, because a lot of these countries came, begged to get into the Eurozone and went through a lot of hoops to get there because they've had, historically have had high unemployment. Of course, there's a host of reasons why the, the, the Euro was formed, yes. But anyway, so I just wonder, you know, they, they brought to the table pretty much the same issues that they're dealing with now, and I don't know if the numbers would change or your... Okay, good question. Okay. Who else? Who was next? You? Hi, uh, Greg Fuller, Johns Hopkins University at SICE. Um, I, I guess, you know, I, I completely take the point that default is something we need to talk about more and that a more activist ECB is what we need to talk about more. But I wanted to push back on the coupling of default and exit because, as we've seen, you can have default without exit. The increase has already had some write-downs. We've had Portugal and Ireland getting some forbearance recently. And the thing is, when you start talking about exit, you know, like we always bring up the, uh, the Argentina example, and when you look at Argentina's imports as a percent of GDP versus Greece's, Greece's are twice to three times as high. So the real income hit in Greece is going to be much higher if you suddenly re-denominate everyone's you know, current accounts in a different currency. So I mean, I'm just saying you don't necessarily have to connect those two. Right. And the very last question, sir. Yeah, but I must from Eurodat, European Network and Debt and Development. I, I agree with the previous speaker that we can have a default, and, and, and but uh, countries like this could remain in the Eurozone. However, the um, question I wanted to pose is, 
the euro crisis mainly a consequence of economic imbalances, and in the euro crisis case it was not economic imbalances with the region outside Europe, but within the eurozone. The problem we have now is that most of the adjustment pressure, or basically all of the adjustment pressure, is on the deficit countries, and not on the surplus Thank countries. Thank you. And the point is, I mean, if you could make suggestions for how to reform the global and the European governance architecture. I have to tell you, we're going to get thrown out of this you room. <laughs> Mark? Mark? Okay. And, and uh, the uh, Bosnia uh, question, the fixed exchange rate, the um, Eurozone. Uh, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I don't see why any government would want to join the Eurozone until it has new management. <laughs> I mean, that to me is a simple question. Okay. David, uh, um, on the question about countries that beg to get into the Eurozone and um, um, I'm just trying to remember the last part of the, whole, the actual the question. They brought the problems they, to the Eurozone that they have now. Yeah. I think that, um, and I guess I can answer the other question too that somebody had about the economic imbalances and, and, and everything. I think there, yeah, there are obviously, I mean, that's one of the things people have written, Krugman has written about it, a lot of people have written about it. You know, uh, you have these economic imbalances and they, uh, the only, you know, there's different ways of adjusting and they are putting all the adjustment on the deficit countries and yeah, that's just wrong. They could put them, I mean, you could have a higher rate of inflation in the, in the surplus countries, Germany in particular. Uh, higher wage increases would be to do the same thing. Um, but they're not, they're not willing to do it. That's a fundamental problem. Uh, but I think the macro is, is still the most immediate thing. You just can't have, I don't think, I mean, I can't imagine any responsible government signing anything that gives their, uh, their country this kind of unemployment these levels of unemployment for that many years. It just seems wrong and irresponsible to me, no matter how you slice it. On the default and exit question, um, yeah, you can have default without exit, although, I mean, the default in Greece was arranged with its uh, with, the, uh, with the Troika. So if Greece says, you know, we're just only going to pay this much, and the Troika says no, they're going to be out of the euro. On the other hand, if they exit the euro, of course, they would probably involve, well, maybe they would give in. I mean, but again, that was my main point, or one of my main points, is they have to have a credible threat to leave, or they just don't have any, any uh, bargaining power. So I guess that's where it, it ends. Um, you know, that's, you know, again, and I'm not advocating anybody leave, but I don't see where they can, uh, how far they can get without having that, that credible threat, at least at this point. And so with that, I would say, we'll see you next year. <laughs> see how Europe is doing, or maybe in six months for the annual meeting. That would Thank be great. You. Okay, I'd love to carry it on, but we are...